Welcome to Soul Medication, your weekly biblical encouragement, the podcast that nourishes your soul and strengthens your faith through the timeless wisdom of God's Word. I'm your host, Michelle Brooks, and I'm honored to be your guide as we delve into the transformative power of Scripture. Each week, we'll open the pages of the Bible and explore the purposes, direction, and guidance that God has for us. Together, we'll study the principles that can shape our daily lives and bring us closer to our Creator. As we embark on this journey, we'll seek the Holy Spirit's guidance and pray so that we may truly understand and apply God's truth in our lives. Whether you're a seasoned believer or just beginning your spiritual journey, Soul Medication is here to uplift and inspire you. Together, let's find solace in God's Word, find strength in His promises, and find hope in His unfailing love. Subscribe to Soul Medication on your favorite podcast platform and join our community of faith-filled individuals who are seeking biblical encouragement and spiritual growth. Let's open our hearts and minds to the transformative power of God's Word as we walk together on this journey of faith. Good Monday morning. I'm your host, Michelle, and today we are continuing our new study in the book of Acts, and we are in chapter 6 today, so let's take a minute and ask for God to bless our time together. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we look at your word today, your Holy Spirit would guide us into all truth as he brings us the things of you and your desires for us. Open our hearts and our minds. Give us a desire to want to do your will, even if our earthly desires are stronger. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So in chapter 5, we left off with the apostles going out preaching even after being imprisoned and beaten for preaching in the name of Jesus and the church still growing. And today we pick up in chapter 6, and it's a short chapter this week, so let's take a look at what is going on here. You can imagine that just like any large group, we know that there were appointed apostles, and that with the growth, it was placing quite a strain to both go out and preach, and then to be in charge of providing money and goods to those who are in need. And we really are not sure of exactly how much time had passed between the last chapter and now. But we do know that most historians have Stephen's death around 38 AD, so there could be a few years here. And in verse 1, it says, Now in those days, when the number of the disciples was multiplying, there arose in a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists. Now the Hellenists are the Greek-speaking Jews, and they were complaining because their widows were neglected in the daily distribution. So they felt that they were being overlooked, neglected when it came to handing out the distributions of relief to those in need. And in Ellicott's commentary for English readers, he writes, Here we have to think of a clamorous crowd of applicants besieging the house at which the apostles held their meeting at the times appointed for giving relief and money. The twelve, singly or in groups, sat at the table and gave as they were able. Under such circumstances, jealousies and complaints were all but avoidable because the 12 apostles were all from Galilee, and so they were suspected of showing favoritism to the widows of Palestine rather than to those of the dispersion. And it was the first sign that the new society was outgrowing its primitive organization. And the disciples, full of the Holy Spirit, knew that in order for the church to continue to grow and thrive, they knew they must address this to avoid any division or scandal. So as it says in verse 2, Then the twelve summoned the multitude of the disciples, the whole body of converts that would be affected by this. And they said, It is not desirable that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. The disciples are saying to the church that God's given them the mission of spreading the word of God, teaching, ministering to others, and that it's not right for them to be taken away from this mission and not honorable to God to do so because it was seen as abandoning the gospel so that they can sit and distribute the donations to the needy. This action of overseeing the distributions took time. It took time to receive the applicants, look into their situations, and then make the distributions accordingly to their needs. Therefore, Brethren, in verse 3, it says, seek out from among you. And this was to be from among the Grecians and the Hebrews, where the actual complaints were coming from. They were to choose seven men of good reputation, full of the Holy Spirit and wisdom, who we may appoint over this business. But we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word. And a little side note here, that prayer does precede the ministry of the word. They acknowledge the need to be prayed up 
to go out and minister to others. And it was highly likely that they're being prayed up and filled with the Holy Spirit that made them sensitive to this issue and the need to address it quickly and the depth of their wisdom in reaching a solution peaceably. So why seven men? It's believed that at this time, the number seven was the number of persons chosen to manage public business in Jewish towns. So this seemed reasonable for the disciples to come up with an appropriate business model for their nonprofit ministry. They were to be full of the spirit and wisdom. So they were to be approved by both man and God. As the disciples noted, they were the ones to appoint these men. They were keeping their, their role of responsibility. And we see that this wisdom was good because in verse five, Luke goes on to mention that the whole multitude was pleased. Now, let me ask, how often does that happen? When is the last time that there was an accusation of social injustice and someone stood up and addressed it and the whole multitude was pleased? And we then see the men that were chosen. Most scholars believe that the seven names are written in order of the choosing, indicating that Stephen was the first choice. And Luke describes Stephen as a man full of faith. He had a strong belief that Jesus was the Messiah, and we see that he was filled with and controlled by the Holy Spirit. So there was quite an accolade to him there. And then the list continues with not as much highlighting or mention. And Philip, a resident of Caesarea, he had four daughters, probably married when he was appointed. And then there was four. We really don't know much about these. Prochorus, Nicanor, Timon, and Parmenas. And then Nicholas, he was a proselyte from Antioch, meaning that he had converted to Christianity. And it's said that Nicholas is the first person that was from, uh, he was admitted as a full member in the church that was not a Hebrew. He was of the, not of the race of Abraham. He was the only one of the seven that did not come from Jerusalem. He came from Antioch, which is what we know as ancient Syria. And after they chose the seven, they sat before the disciples And when they had prayed, they laid hands on them. It was customary to do this as a way to dedicate the men to the office that they had been selected for. And in verse 7, it says, Then the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. How cool is that? Now, I'm really thinking back to Gamaliel's word to the priests and leaders, because the gospel spread in a way that even a great many of the priests came to believe in the gospel. If you listened in last week's podcast, Gamaliel was the Pharisee. He was the teacher. And he told the Jewish leaders to leave the disciples alone. And if it was not of God, it would die out. Well, it certainly does not look like it has died out here yet. What a testimony that God was surely behind this movement of what began as 12 men. And now is thousands and even a great many of the priests. And so... With the problem at hand, there could have been a riot. There could have been a division, a breakup in the church. But because of the flow of the Holy Spirit and the wisdom of God, the disciples, the apostles dealt wisely with this situation and the church continues to grow. And Luke goes on to capture more about Stephen. Verse 8 tells us, And Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and signs among the people, truly a way to see the fruits of Follow the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. And in verse 9, Then there arose from some of what is called the synagogue of the freed men. These were Cyrenians, Alexandrians, and those from Cilicia and Asia, disputing with Stephen. Now the synagogue of the freed men was believed by many to be Jews who had been taken captive and then set free by the Romans and from synagogues within the areas mentioned here. But let's stop for a minute and look at Cilicia. This one stood out because what do we know about this province? Well, it was the province in Asia Minor. And we know that its capital was Tarsus. Who do we know that came from Tarsus? Saul of Tarsus? Does that sound familiar? And most likely, Saul would have gone to this synagogue. And it could be that Saul was one of the men that was disputing with Stephen. Highly likely. In Acts 22, verse 20, just after Saul encounters his life-changing confrontation with God, we see that he is recanting his testimony. And he is even says, And when the blood of your witness martyr, Stephen, was shed, I also was personally standing by and consenting and approving and guarding the garments of those who slew him. 
And next week, we will look at chapter 7, and in verse 58, it says, Then they dragged him, talking about Stephen, out of the city and began to stone him. And the witnesses placed their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. So what do you think they were disputing? Let's go back to that. Most likely, and many say undoubtedly, that Jesus was the Messiah. I can see this. Looking at the description of Stephen described earlier by his strong belief in Jesus as the Messiah, and so the debate was on. But something happens when you're filled with the power and wisdom of the Holy Spirit. Remember, he brings to mind all that he knows of the Father, and it says in verse 10 that they were not able to resist the wisdom and the spirit by which he spoke. In other words, they recognized that Stephen, in fact, had a thorough knowledge of their scripture, but they were not able to provide answers to the arguments that he was presenting. And then there was his zeal. Barnes notes on the Bible writes, the evidence of sincerity, honesty, and zeal in a public speaker will often go further to convince the great mass of mankind than the most able argument if delivered in a cold and indifferent manner. And so what did this group of Jewish men do? They secretly induced men to say, we've heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. They suborned men. In other words, they secretly instigated and instructed men to take a false oath, to bear false witness that Stephen had blasphemed against Moses and God. God, I understand. So I had to dig a little more for the addition of Moses here, but Moses was considered their divine lawgiver. And as I thought about this, I considered the irony here because they literally bear false witness against someone. So they're breaking one of the very commandments brought forth by Moses, this divine lawgiver from God in order to bring about their purpose or their plan. But it worked because in verse 12, we see that they stirred up the people. They fired up both the government and the mob against Stephen, the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him, seized him and brought him to the council. They also set up false witnesses who said, this man does not cease to speak blasphemous words against his this holy place and the law. For we've heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and change the customs which Moses delivered to us. What were they talking about? Well, if we remember Jesus and one of his accusations of him right before his death was that the leaders charged him with blasphemy because he had said in John 2, 19, that the sign of his authority was to destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up again. Of course, referring to him as the very temple. Stephen, preaching the Messiah, may very well have been using these words from the Messiah in his teaching about the resurrection of Christ. And in preaching the resurrection of Christ, how can you provide that message without the explanation of what the death of Jesus provides? But salvation and sanctification, doing away with the very need for the sacrifices which were of the law of Moses. The expositor's Greek Testament writes, if Stephen did not employ the actual words, we can easily understand how plausibly they might be attributed to him. To preach the resurrection, to glorify the Messiah, to say that Jesus, the crucified Lord, was to receive all the glory, was to declare that the whole infrastructure of the Jewish law had changed. It was as if the rug was being pulled out from under them and they were reeling to keep some sense of normalcy and comfort with the law of Moses because that was all they knew. And as the council heard the testimony, verse 15 says that they looked intently at him. And what did they see? They saw his face as the face of an angel. Now, some scholars have described this verse. Meyer's commentary says all the Sanhedrists saw the countenance of Stephen angelically glorified, superhuman, angel-like, external, externally visible to them. Jameson Fawcett Brown writes, It was a play of supernatural radiance, attesting to all who beheld his countenance, the divine calm of the spirit within the pulpit commentary wrote, the council would naturally, naturally all look at him in expectation of his answer to the evidence just delivered against him. In his face, illuminated with the divine radiance, they had an answer which they would have done well to listen to. And so we will find out next week more about what happens to Stephen, but also his powerful message to the leaders. So don't miss out on that. But let's recap chapter six and what we learned this week. 
McLaren's Expositions covers the filling of the Holy Spirit so well, I wanted to share this. He writes, if there is a God at all, so maybe you're wondering that today, there is nothing more reasonable than to suppose that he can come into direct contact with the spirits of the men whom he has made. And if that almighty God is not an almighty indifference or a pure devil, if he is love, then there is nothing more certain that if he can touch and influence men's hearts toward goodness and his own likeness, he most certainly will. This makes me think of the very Holy Spirit of God living and dwelling with my, in my own soul. And I say today, have your way. Do your thing in me. The second thing I want to talk about Stephen, and here's Stephen. Now, Stephen most likely had less knowledge of God than we might have had. He certainly didn't have the full Bible in any translation in his fingertips, whether in print or on his smartphone. And yet, because he was filled with the Holy Spirit, he appears to be a mature follower and believer. He's able and capable of leading others and well-respected, as we can see by the voting turnout. And maybe you're wondering why your life seems substandard. Why is it less than what you think a Christian believer life should be? And I'm here to tell you that the Holy Spirit is our seal of approval. It says in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that you are God's temple and that God's Spirit has his permanent dwelling in you. If my Christian life is not filled with the Holy Spirit, then it is my own doing. Maybe you're settling for a mere sprinkling of the Holy Spirit and you feel empty inside. Maybe you feel as if your fire is going out. But I encourage you to pray daily for a new and a fresh indwelling of the Holy Spirit, a new commitment every morning to be sensitive to the Spirit, to do as He directs, to say what He guides you to say, to go where He leads you to go. And recently I was reading a book from Priscilla Shire, great book, by the way, about being able to discern when God is speaking to you. And one of the things that the author mentioned was God speaks to those who listen and obey. And boy, was that a mic drop for me when I read those words that day. The third thing is we should see the zeal of state of Stephen. What is it about God when you meditate and reflect on him that fires you up? And what makes you want to shout his praise from the rooftops? I know over the last few weeks, I've been very zealous over God's provision of some victories in my health. I've been on this journey over the last year trying to get my strength back, my physical strength. And I love to run. I love running long distance. And last year, this all had come to a sudden halt. And when I began to have many falls and started having difficulty with my muscles, I felt like my legs didn't belong to me. Like when I tried to go for a run, they would feel like lead and the doctors had had very few answers for me in the past. So I tried something new. I tried an integrative nurse practitioner. She put me on the right path. I really believe this. And so I have been on this health journey when I, this really started as I began to write my last devotional, how well is your soul? Because God was showing me that my body was his temple. And I can't put junk in his temple, junk food, junk TV, junk reading, junk relationships. I cannot put junk in his temple. That I needed self-control, the very fruit of the Holy Spirit when it came to eating. That if I could not control my appetite for food, I would have trouble with my appetite for sin and wrong desires. So over the last year, I've really leaned into the word of God for guidance and wisdom. And this often translates into our health. Finding rest, eating the right things, managing our stress and emotions. And then with the help of some various supplements, I really began to find relief from this chronic pain, chronic pain that I'd had for decades. I went from no running or walking back to running again, and I'm feeling better every day, week by week. This is my zeal. This is my rooftop cry that with Christ, I can do all things. He does keep me from stumbling. He does draw us to him in order to keep us from the assault of the evil one. And that comes from 2 Timothy 4.18. And if you write down, look up, write down anything today, that's a verse to keep next to you. 
And as I've built up my zeal for God's direction, his leading, his healing power, and his very presence of his Holy Spirit invading every facet of my life, this tr- has trickled over into my business as I begin to see movement in my business and the ability to help others in their search for wellness. So as we mentioned, when we talk about Stephen, zeal will go a long way. What are you zealous for? I'll tell you. Satan would have you believe a lie that it's hopeless, that there's no hope for you, whether it's spiritual or physical. He wants you to quit. Are you zealous for the things of God, for the way that God invades your life, for the fact that this is not a religion, but that our faith in Jesus is built on a progressive relationship? What a victory in that. I want to thank you so much for joining me today. I really hope and pray that you have victory today in your spiritual walk, that you've been encouraged in your heart and in your soul. And the word of God has truly been your soul medication today. Thank you so much for joining us for another episode of Soul Medication. I hope you found it encouraging and a spiritual lift to your soul. If you're enjoying these messages, I hope that you will hit the subscribe, hit the follow, the free, and share them with others. You can also leave us a review. Feel free to visit our website. The link is in the show notes. Follow us on social media at Soul Medication 2023 on Instagram or Soul Medication on Facebook. You can find lots of encouragement, challenges, and resources such as my new devotional, How Well Is Your Soul?, available now on the website or from Amazon. Have a wonderful week and may God richly bless you.